www.ivanpetrovich.com. Uh, you go to emailrevealer.com, uh, you get a copy of my book, How to Succeed as a Private Investigator. And you can also, uh, you think your spouse is cheating on you, you can uh, send me their email address. I'll trace it back to online dating websites. And also, if you got an iPhone, I can unlock it for you. How's that? Okay. <laughs> We're going to be talking about that on the after show tonight. Uh, we do all kinds of cell phone forensics and stuff, and uh, there's a lot about that story out in the news. It's a little shady to me. Okay. The first time you listen to this show, uh, check out oppermanreport.com. Okay. You go there, and uh, we've got a member section with extra shows. Uh, a little confusion about that. We do the live show free Friday night. That's free. Like we're doing tonight with our guest, uh, Jay Dyer. Uh, and then we do the Saturday afternoon show on American Freedom Radio. That's free. But I do extra shows, extra shows for you because I love my audience so much. I love you guys so much. You have no idea. I give you these extra shows, but you got to pay me for them. Those we charge you for. Okay. And by the way, guys, in the chat room, we are live tonight. I'm doing this live, 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 every kind of way live. Uh, we have tonight with us Jay Dyer. And he's the author of the upcoming book called Esoteric Hollywood. And he also has a website uh, called jaysanalysis.com. And it has a, he has a podcast uh, that's a subscriber-based. And he also writes all kinds of stuff. So everything's there. So, Jay, are you there? I am, Ed. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being on the show. Absolutely. Enjoy. Let me ask you a question, man. Uh, J- Jay's analysis. Yeah. Do you have a lot of people who can't spell analysis and have trouble getting to that site? Well, I get a bunch of dumb jokes about anal cysts. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, uh, I don't know if that was the best choice, but, you know, this kind of stuff happens where, you you know, you, you say, I'm going to start a blog and you pick a name and then it, you know, it grows and then, you're, you know, God, was that the best choice? I don't know. Too late now. Yeah, because I got a website called Email Revealer and nobody knows how to spell it Revealer. <laughs> Email Reveler is right. Yeah, it's crazy, man. Okay, so tell us about yourself, Jay. Who is Jay uh, Dyer? Oh, well, I'm a CIA plant, and I'm here to it. obfuscate. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm a uh, uh, guy from the South who grew up uh, in uh, San Diego. My dad was in the Navy, and we moved back to the South when he uh, ended his naval term. And so I grew up kind of back in my hometown. And a small town guy who lived in uh, San Diego and went to college. Uh, my parents were you know, big fans of the arts. So I always grew up with uh, books and interests in, you know, theater, acting, comedy, stand up, film, you name it. And so when I went to college, I thought, uh, you know, I want to study history of religions. I want to study philosophy. I want to study the arts. And so that's what I did. And then uh, I guess about 18, age 18 or 19, I got really interested in um, alternative history, uh, conspiracies, things like that started reading about the UN and, you know, different conspiracy theories about that stuff. And that kind of took me into this whole, you know, alternative sphere of information that uh, really would bloom in the last 15 years, I guess, through the Internet. And uh, I've always loved books, so I just would read on any kind of topic. I could get my, you know, anything I'd get my hands on, I would read. So really the website's just kind of a reflection of my interests and um, the reason that there's a lot of movie analyses is that that's, you know, kind of what drives the traffic. That's what everybody likes to read. But that's actually not the majority of what's there. Majority of what's there is uh, geopolitics, philosophy, espionage, history, literature analysis, etc. And, uh, you know, there's like 500 articles that deal with that and there's about 105 or so uh, film analysis. So <laughs> this is ironic, you know, the film analysis is really what, what everybody comes to the site for. And then, you know, if they per chance get interested, you know, they can read all these uh, weird other articles that deal with, uh, you know, all kinds of other crazy topics. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit of everything, I guess you could say. And it's, you know, mainly my work, probably 90 to 95% my work. And uh, it's just kind of what I like to do. And, and how old are you now? I just uh, turned 37. 37, okay. And and how long have you had been doing this website? Uh, this site I've done for about five or six years, five years. Uh, I had an older site uh, that dealt with a lot of the same material, but uh, I got rid of it and decided to rebrand it. So I guess I've been blogging about eight, eight or nine years, and uh, you know, it kind of it kind of takes that long to. Uh, you know, really build it up into something that, you know, has an archive and, you know, people can can really dig into. Um, so, you know, like I said, you've got 
six, seven hundred articles there that, uh, that you can really dig into. It deals with everything, man. It's, it's, I really think it's, there's not another site like it. Uh, you know, that's kind of cliche, I guess, but, uh, I don't think in our genre of topics that we deal with, you know, in alternative media or whatever, I don't, I don't really think there's anything like my site. Okay. Um, now, now you got this book coming up too, uh, Esoteric Hollywood. I guess it's the same kind of thing, but, but what do you got planned for that? Right. Well, so I, you know, I've been, I started with film. That's really what got me going on the website was, you know, you start, if you, if you grew up loving movies, as probably most Americans do, um, but yeah, I always took an interest in all things religious, philosophical, and theological. And so you start noticing that much like you would do literary analysis, maybe in college, the same kind of stuff's going on in movies. And so I just started writing film analyses, not from the perspective of, you know, Roger Ebert or Leonard Maltin, you know, telling you whether the film's good or not, but, you know, like what, what's actually going on under the surface here? Uh, and that's, that's a legitimate, you know, avenue of interpretation, especially if, you know, if you get a university education, you'll, you'll learn how to read novels this way and so i thought well why not uh take that same approach and apply it to film but not just do a literary reading of film but actually uh you know point out oh this is you know a history of uh say you know a spy operation black uh, black ops covert ops that's based in reality and you, know, and you start to learn this is what i focused on in grad school is that the fictional presentation in the film or a novel actually can become part of uh, the story Right, because especially in propaganda or psyops, what's presented in Hollywood is going to be a big factor in determining the perception of the people in the audience in terms of how they're going to interpret some event. So, you know, Michael Bay is going to direct a Benghazi movie, and that's going to influence people's <laughs> interpretation far more than bare bones news reporting, right? So, that's kind of what it's all about. I, I take uh, everything that I've learned in, you know, many years of philosophy and uh, comparative religion, and I apply that to to film analysis to produce what I think is you know really unique approach to reading film. Hey, did I just lose you? No, no. I, sometimes <laughs> I mute. Oh yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I thought I Okay. And now I was going to ask you. Um, are you familiar with Tom Secker's work? And Pierce Redman, how they, they analyze those films. And, and what they do, too, is um, Tom's done this work that's incredible. It's on spyculture.com. I've had him on the show a couple of times where they get the Freedom of Information Act requests uh, for the military and the FBI and their uh, Hollywood liaison offices and how much influence the DOD and the CIA and the FBI and all these agencies have in, in uh in not just movies and, and TV shows, but even reality TV shows. Uh, one of them that they uncovered was a, a, a contestant on American Idol uh, was from Fort Bragg, and he was in the Psychological Warfare Department from War Fort Bragg. And he has all the documents on that. Have you looked into that kind of stuff? Oh, yeah, I have. Uh, I mean, I've cited those types of, of instances many times in my articles. There's a lot of books on this. You know, Trisha Jenkins has a book, Hollywood and the CIA. Uh James Rizzo has a book uh, about uh, CIA in Hollywood and drug trafficking. So, you know, there's no shortage of information like that. And I, I enjoy uh, Tom Secker's work quite a bit. We've chatted here and there. Um, and, uh, you know, I have made use of their work, and uh, he's linked me as well. So there's definitely cross-pollination and, and cross-interest there. Uh, we do deal with a lot of the same material. Uh, the only difference is that uh, while they deal a lot with geopolitics and espionage in Hollywood, uh, I deal a lot with uh, the uh, occult and esoteric as well. So there's a, um, I'm not trying to, you know, one up those guys. I think that they do really great work, and uh, you know, we're we're on good terms. Uh, but I, I take another dimension as well, where you know, I deal with uh, archetypes. I deal with, uh, you know, the esoteric. I deal with cult uh, and occult presentations in film. And symbolism and symbology that that goes into film is very important. Um, I believe that's its own kind of language. Uh, it's encapsulated in its own sort of intertextual context, as it's called. Uh, and it becomes, uh, in, like I said before, its own kind of script, right? That requires, um, I guess you could say, eyes to see to read it. Um, I'm not trying to say I'm like a 
guru or anything, but, uh, you know, that's, that's what I do, you know, so I take something like, uh, David Lynch's Twin Peaks, which was a very, very esoteric presentation of what I take to be an allegorical reading of America. So if you watch Twin Peaks, uh, the, the series, the two series and the, the, the film, uh, you're dealing with uh, occult ritual murder. Uh, and that's actually what the conclusion of the series is about. Spoiler alert, if you've never seen it, sorry, but that's what the film is about. And so, you know, I wrote a really extensive analysis of that dealing with, you know, ancient religions and so forth. And I think, I, I don't mean to toot my horn too much here, but... No, go ahead. But what really sets my stuff off from something like Vigilant Citizen or whatever is that I really try to make it uh, relatively academic, uh, pretty scholarly, but not so academic or scholarly that it's too abstruse for, you know, mainstream readers. It's it's very readable. I try to be um, affable in my prose and style, uh, but the... You know, the content is a little bit me more, there's, it's meatier than something like Vigilant Citizen. So it's, it's an alternative to that kind of stuff. And I was actually doing my stuff before there was a Vigilant Citizen anyway, but that's a different story. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, if you like Tom Secker's stuff, uh, you'll love Jay's analysis. It might be a little more, you know, uh, edging on, um, you know, comparative religion, uh, and stuff like that, theology. Uh, but, uh, there's definitely, you know, I've, I've probably reviewed, I don't know, 15 or 20 espionage films and how they relate to, you know, real world events. Uh, I did my graduate work on Ian Fleming uh, in his uh, Bond series and the whole background of propaganda that went into who the character of Ian Fleming was and the, the whole, not just the, the uh, novels that Ian Fleming wrote, but also the 23 or so films. Um, you know, they, they all actually present real world uh, espionage covert slash black operations. Really? Did you ever notice that one? Uh, what was it? Uh, the one where they, they had that scene where the guys had landed on the moon. Remember, uh, what was that one? Uh, that's in Diamonds Are Forever, and uh, yeah, that's curious because that's the film, as uh, I've mentioned many times, that is about Howard Hughes. Uh, the stand-in character played by uh, Jimmy Dean is a stand-in for Howard Hughes, and that's explicit in the film as well as uh, you know, if you do graduate work, you're going to read all the secondary material on it. Or a large portion of it, and then all the uh, secondary, you know, scholarly sources actually back up that fact. It's it's pretty obvious when you watch the film, and that's why the character in the film kind of disappears for a few years, where he's like hiding out and nobody can find him. And this was actually what happened to uh, to Howard Hughes, where he supposedly disappeared for a while. And there's you know there's actually FBI files on uh, the Howard Hughes' story and his disappearance and all that. So. This ties into the rumored uh, gemstone files and May Brussel and all that, which I don't really, I'm not intending on going down that rabbit hole, but it is very fascinating. And that's one instance of where you can see um, the movie pres presentation, at least, you know, uh, tying in all of these real world espionage events. The novel Diamonds of Forever, however, is not like that movie. Uh, it's loosely based on the movie. But uh, Ian Fleming was, of course, in contact with uh, Broccoli and Saltzman, who produced it uh, throughout this period. So, you know, there's, there's still the, the possibility that even in these uh, later film adaptations, uh, you're still getting, you know, real actual events that went down, you know, kind of revelation of the method type stuff. And, and so then what did you make about that scene with the moon landing, when they were faking the moon landing? Uh, I think that's... Uh, uh, it was intentional. There's no, no question in my mind that, uh, you know, if you look at the character of Ian Fleming, um, you know, I've, I've talked about this a lot. You know, he was a high level naval psyops guy. Uh, he was involved in the special operations executive, uh, that, that the British ministry started to, uh, focus mere, uh, solely on, uh, World War II, uh, propaganda and deception. Uh, he worked with a character by the name of Dennis Wheatley, uh, William Stevenson, um, Maxwell Knight. These were all, guys in his circle who uh, focused on uh, special operations and it was all about deception trickery stagecraft and a lot of the techniques that Hollywood would use so you can see why Ian Fleming would you know immediately go into uh, writing fiction and when working in Hollywood there's a there's a, a direct tie in there by the way I don't, but but you didn't know that uh, Christopher Lee uh, famous actor who recently passed away was also a member of the special operations executive uh, you know tied into British intelligence Actually, so I, did, I do remember that. I, I'm not the big fan of Christopher Lee, but I do recall hearing that. Yes, uh, uh, and, and you find this everywhere. Uh, this is yeah. what's so fascinating is that 
You can look at um, other characters in these circles. Roald Dahl, who wrote uh, Charlie and Chocolate Factory, Fantastic Mr. Fox. Uh, Roald Dahl was a British intelligence agent who worked with Walt Disney to uh, help craft propaganda that Disney would film. And this is a circle of people known as the Corda Circle. And this is Samuel Goldwyn of Goldwyn Meyer, Douglas Fairbanks, Walter Wagner. And uh, they worked also with Alfred Hitchcock. And so a lot of what they were doing was World War II propaganda, you know, back in the 40s. And then when it trans just transitioned to the Cold War, uh, you had a lot of these same guys just kind of continuing their, their uh, theatrics. And, and that's something that I focus on a lot is the parallel between um, Hollywood and espionage. You know, these are, these are two worlds that uh, I think in the minds of most people are not really connected other than, well, there's a lot of spy movies and there's a character named James Bond. But a lot of actors have been spies, and that's what's really, you know, makes the story, you know, I guess a meta level, right, fascinating. Yeah, yeah, it, it's disturbing too, you know. Well, it is because, uh, you know, which, if you have what you have with Hitchcock is, uh, you know, not just uh, the idea of creating war propaganda for. He actually filmed two films that were not well known, uh, that were uh, for the French Resistance, and you might think, oh, well, that's, you know. That's the good guys. Well, the problem is that uh, uh, he would later go on to have associations with the Tavistock Institute. And during the Cold War, uh, the films that you're watching, like Psycho, the techniques that are used um, in these movies are actual scientific specified techniques that would go into the war on terror. So in other words, you can actually find documentation that the Tavistock Institute techniques of... Um, social engineering and creating terror uh, were working hand in hand with what Hitchcock was doing. They liked what Hitchcock was doing. Hitchcock said he wanted to use the same methodology of some of these uh, psychological operations masters to create terror, right? So there you have a direct connection between PSYOPs and Hollywood, particularly in the character of Hitchcock. And it's not by accident that, uh, you know, Cary Grant uh, worked for uh, military intelligence. He uh, outed uh, Errol Flynn, uh, supposedly, as a Nazi sympathizer. Uh, you have Jimmy Stewart. Uh, you know, these are two fixtures of Hitchcock films. Uh, Jimmy Stewart also reportedly worked for the FBI and starred in the 1959 film The FBI Story, where he is uh, <laughs> an FBI agent, and the film is actually given approval by J. Edgar Hoover. So uh, you know, uh, a lot of what's going on throughout you know, these decades of Hollywood ties directly into intelligence. And, um, and yet another thing I, I point out quite often that's kind of curious is that if you read a lot on espionage, the history of spycraft, you generally get the impression, especially from Western writers, that something like um, swallows or ravens, or, or as they're called, or sex espionage, that this was a feature of you know, foreign nations. So the Soviets and the NKVD and Stalin would engage in this. Uh, but, you know, the, the CIA, the West, the OSS, they would never do this. Well, that's, that's actually not true. Uh, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, you can, curiously and ironically, watch two Hitchcock films where the CIA and OSS actually do this. The 1940, I think, four film, Notorious, with uh, Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman, actually features Cary Grant as a raven, the male sex uh, operative who uh, lures Ingrid Bergman into becoming a sex operative as well for the OSS at that time, which was founded in 1942, I think. Uh, and so then you know, with 1947, you have the CIA. And then um, with, for example, North by Northwest, Cary Grant appears once again, uh, a man out of the advertising world uh, <laughs> wrapped up in the, um, the uh, spy yeah. world <laughs> with uh, Ava Marie Saint, uh, who's playing the character Ava Kendall in North by Northwest, she lures Cary Grant into uh, a sexual uh, operation where she's spying on James Mason, uh, who is a Soviet. So what I'm getting at is that, you know, curiously, even in the midst of the narrative that, uh, you know, the West and the OSS and CIA never engaged in sex espionage, you simultaneously have <laughs> the movies uh, by Hitchcock presenting the fact that they do. Uh, and I believe that they do. So, you know, this is not a feature that was uh, something, uh, you know, only the nefarious Soviets did. This was actually a, a feature of espionage throughout the, the, the last several thousand years. This is nothing new. Oh, boy, this is depressing. 
<laughs> well, I don't mean to be depressing. <laughs> no, we can talk about goofy stuff. This is <laughs> it's heavy stuff, man. Because well, you're just... talking about the West Memphis Three. I mean, that's not exactly uh, you know flowers no, and Candyland. No, I agree. But <laughs> but the West Memphis Three is like isolated to a small. Well, and it's, it's it's isolated in a way. But when you think of like we, like because. Is it overwhelming to, to try and resist this government and its oppression, this oppression, this spy agency, if they control all the media and they control all the movies and they control everything that, that, that we're watching and stuff? Uh, it just it becomes like a, it's an overwhelming task to try and uh, oppose it. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't think they control everything in the, in the yeah. sense of, like, you know, there's a lot of independent movies that get made that have good messages, uh, but uh, unfortunately, you know, anything blockbuster yeah, is going to be controlled for sure. Oh, yeah. Now, let me ask you a question. We're going back a ways. Now, it, it seems also, too, and this is kind of a different category than, than what we've discussed so far, that, uh, that they seem to want to come out with the official version of big events, like the OJ trial, like the Jim Jones, uh, People's Temple, how they came out with that uh, docu- you know, that series. You know, it was a two-part show, movie, uh, TV movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, another one was the McMartin. They, they came out with a story about the McMartin case. Hmm. And where they come up with their official version, and another one was Jeffrey McDonald, because uh, I've I've become friends with his uh, his wife, his current wife, Catherine McDonald, and, uh, and like, it's like they have an official version that they want to put out and kind of brainwash the public that everybody when they think of the Jeff McDonald case, they think of that TV series from the '70s or the '80s, a long time ago, or when they think of McMartin, he says, "No, I saw that movie. It can't be, you know, nobody knows it's fake." What do you make of that kind of stuff? I, I think that uh, a lot of times that coordination that you're speaking of is intentional. Right. I don't think there's any other way around it. And while that may sound far-fetched, uh, the more that you delve into this kind of stuff, you you will notice uh, just countless examples of coordination across the board that cannot be accidental or coincidental. There has to be forethought, planning, and, and strategy involved in this. And this is kind of where I come in and say, oh, yeah, there is. And, uh, you know, I can tell you, you know, how that is. And, this, you know, the CIA has been doing this for a long time. You know, films like Argo, this is based on a book by Antonio Mendez. Uh, Antonio Mendez is the CIA's uh, guy for disguises and subterfuge throughout the Cold War, uh, you know, according to his book on it. And uh, so then the film Argo gets made and, you know, you, you watch interviews of Ben Affleck, and he says, uh, yeah, well, the Hollywood's uh, full of the CIA. You know, that's everywhere. You know, this is public uh, mainstream information. So there, there's nothing secretive about this. There are interviews with Bruce Willis where he says, you know, acting is a lot like working in the CIA, and the CIA is a lot like working in Hollywood. Uh, you know, you, if you have mainstream A-listers talking about this openly, it shouldn't be that far of a stretch, I don't think. But that's really how uh, propaganda and... Psychological operations have always spoke, uh, uh, worked. Uh, you know, you go all the way back to, like I mentioned earlier, Howard Hughes. He was making uh, war propaganda films back in the uh, 30s, uh, Hell's Angels. Um, this was uh, World War, uh, well, I guess leading up to World War II. Um, you know, hardcore propaganda that was, uh, you know, demonizing any uh, opponent of uh, American foreign policy, American expansionism. So. You know, it's really a banker's game. I, you know, I don't mean to get off into that, but if you look at where, who funds the studios, you know, where their money comes from, and even a lot of studios are actually tied into uh, money laundering, and uh, they can be kind of shells or front corporations for hiding tax money, hiding liquid ass, uh, liquid cash, and so forth. There's that. There's that whole side of Hollywood that that can't be missed as well, which ties into the mob and mafia and all that. Actually, this is. Um, referenced in the Godfather trilogy, believe it or not. If you go back and watch that, uh, those three movies, uh, you'll get a in-depth insight into all the things that I'm saying. In fact, in the first film, uh, the Godfather's, uh, I don't know if it's the guy who's going to, he's the singer and he's going to marry uh, somebody, maybe the Godfather's daughter, I can't remember, but, you know, he comes to me and says, oh, Godfather, you know, I need to, I need that spot, I need the spot in this movie, right? And, uh, and then, uh, Vito Corleone sends his guy out to uh, Walt's Pictures and says, "My guy's going to be in your movie, right?" And the guy says, "Hey, I'm not putting him in your. I'm not putting that guy in my damn movie. There's no way." And then he wakes up with a you know a horse head in his bed. <laughs> right? Now Mario Puzo's book is actually based on 
uh, the testimony of, uh, you know, real mafia people. And of course there's the rumor that, uh, you know, he had to get approval from the Sicilian mafia, mafia right. to, to write the book. I don't know how true that is, but, uh, you know, th this gives us an image, a picture is what I'm trying to say. And, you know, this is where you see, you know, Hollywood ties in Vegas ties in with, uh, you know, uh, Godfather two, where they're expanding into Vegas and Cuba and, you know, the revolution in Cuba happens and so forth. So, you know, this is all, based on uh, reality and that's that's what I try to focus on is uh, to illustrate you know the real world events and how much of this ties into espionage you know not just spy films you know there's a lot of movies that that aren't technically spy films but deal with all these kinds of topics now I mean, you mentioned before Ben Affleck coming out and uh, Bruce Willis coming out and making like public statements has anybody really come out and uh, blown the whistle on all this kind of stuff and really talked about it well, like I said, there's a lot of books and there's a lot of mainstream kind of just blase, you know, oh, no big deal. Yeah, J.J. Uh, J. Abrams is working with the CIA on Alias, big deal. Oh, yeah, you know, Chase Moran and Milt Bearden, their CIA, uh, you know, liaisons with Hollywood and they, uh, you know, consult and help with all these movies. Uh, oh, yeah, you know, the, the CIA worked directly on the film The Recruit and, you know, part of it was filmed at the uh, the farm and, oh, you know, but it's, it's so, I mean, there's a million articles that talk about this stuff openly, uh, but, you know, it's, uh, I guess it's not, you know, it's just not something in the mass uh, mind that's perceived to be, uh, you know, a real connection. You know, they don't, they don't really, most people I don't think have an understanding of how the real world, you know, really operates, so it's it's not really... It's not really known. It's not really not perceived. But now, but it's everywhere. I mean, Jennifer Garner went from Alias to doing PR with the CIA. Oh, bro, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, now, what about a guy like Woody Harrelson? <laughs> you know, like you know, this guy, his father is allegedly, even possibly involved one of the JFK assassins. You know, but he was an assassin. He was a hired assassin for sure. Yeah, he's a hitman. And of course, you know, Woody says he, you know, he's estranged uh, from that guy, and you never, you know, he didn't have contact with him, and. You know, who knows? I mean, I, mean, I don't know. Uh, uh, just, I guess it depends on what you can turn up. I haven't really, you know, delved into Woody Harrelson's history or anything or read any bios of him. Um, I wouldn't say that this is a foolproof test, but a lot of times you can kind of get maybe a hint based on the roles that people play. And I actually think there is a deeper... This is my own speculative theory, but I, I wonder at times if um, there isn't a reason why certain people are chosen for so, certain roles for a reason. And, you know, if you believe in esoteric, you know, woo-woo, juju, occult type stuff, yeah. uh, there would be a reason why this might be, because it would, uh, 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 if you go back to, like, the Stanislavski method of, uh, of acting, which is uh, based on occult techniques, where you're, you're really supposed to actually take on the persona of the actor that or the person that you're playing in the role, uh, and Stanislavski was uh, directly involved in occult practices. So, uh, you know, if people take that perspective, and of course a lot of the Hollywood A-listers are uh, method actors, um, you know, they might have the, the worldview, um, certain producers and directors might have the worldview that, you know, you can actually uh, ritually or magically charge the, the performance uh, through um, this kind of, what's called a uh, correspondence or association. So if, you know, Jennifer Garner's, uh, I'm not saying Jennifer Garner's like in some occult thing. I'm just saying, for example, you know, if she's really, really was recruited by the CIA, well, it makes sense why she might play a spy in a film. And a lot of these people that uh, are playing spy roles are the people that we find out are spies, curiously. Yeah, and you have uh, Woody Harrison, you know, he played, played an assassin in a... Uh... No Country for Old Men. Yeah, he's played an assassin quite a few times, uh, yeah, as, as has John Cusack. And John Cusack is curious because he uh, he made that famous statement a while back about uh, whenever Maps to the Stars came out, and he gave an interview, I think, with The Guardian or somewhere, where he said, look, you know, you want to know what Hollywood is. Hollywood is a big whorehouse. <laughs> And, uh, you know, there's some interesting documentaries on Hollywood and secret societies where you can uh, kind of trace out and get a picture of what's going on, and it, and it starts to make sense that, uh, you know, how actually what you, what you're doing if you're high if you're a high profile actress and you're good looking, and you're playing a role, uh, you're kind of advertising yourself, and sometimes this could mean um, you're advertising yourself for playing in a rich guy's fantasy, 
Yeah. So when you watch Eyes Wide Shut, you know, this is a perfect example of what I'm what I'm getting at. I have a detailed analysis of you know most of the films that we've discussed. Watch Eyes Wide Shut. Uh, you know, that's you, you're peering into uh, what really goes on, as hard as that might be to believe for some people. But it shouldn't be that hard to believe, given now that we're starting to learn this stuff about Savile and these, you know, the Franklin cover up. Why would it be hard to believe that you know something like what we see in Eyes Wide Shut is real? You know, uh, I uh, was involved with someone. Uh, you know, I'm a private investigator, and uh, I worked at a client who ran an escort service mm-hmm. in in Hollywood um, with a lot of A-list actors and stuff like that. And I was told that uh, a lot of these, especially the younger actresses, uh, in like in big TV series, you know, <laughs> you would say. Oh, would go and and do prostitution like to these you know they they would go to a, a Dubai and stuff like that and get paid a hundred thousand uh, dollars. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's also uh, you know it's also a good um, blackmail uh, tool as well. Uh, I, mean, I'm, I know you're probably well familiar with that, but a lot of people don't probably don't think about the fact that uh, I don't know about the Heidi Fly situation in particular if that was uh, like a blackmail thing, but I'm just using it as an example. You know, well you've got all these you know. Big time Hollywood people, uh, you know, you got, you got senators, government types, uh, you know, who are using her services. Uh, you know, you, a lot of times uh, the madam would be the person who might be, uh, you know, the informant or who might be working with uh, some government agency. Uh, you know, that that's another angle uh, on how this kind of stuff all kind of ties together. Uh, and interestingly, I mentioned the Godfather. You know, you watch Godfather Two. There's that. that uh, wild scene where uh, the, the Michael Corleone needs the senator to uh, okay one of his projects or whatever it is, some some legality, and the senator doesn't want to go along with it, so they just wait until the senator comes to one of the Corleone-owned uh, brothels, <laughs> and then they uh, get him in the bed with uh, you know the, the dead hooker. Uh, so yeah. Then they've got you know the uh, legality they need. They need. So you know that's a lot of what goes to. I mean, people have talked about this in terms of uh, the NSA and the spying. And, you know, this is a, an angle uh, where that ties in, where a lot of the NSA stuff is. You know, could be blackmail for mainly for you know government government types. Yeah, people have no idea how prevalent blackmail is. You know, uh, okay, let's take a commercial break. Uh, we're here with uh, Jay Dyer, a really brilliant guy. I think you know, a little, little, a little over my head. <laughs> Very, uh, I'm very impressed, Jay. Uh, Jay Jay Dyer. His uh, website is jaysanalysis.com, and he's the author of the upcoming book, Esoteric Hollywood. Uh, so if you're enjoying this, you go to jaysanalysis.com. He also has a, like a, a subscription uh, that you can subscribe to that uh, uh, keeps things going. So we'll be right back uh, after these messages here uh, with more of Jay Dyer and his book, uh, Esoteric Hollywood. Let me just pull this up here. And... And everybody complains about the static, so I gotta mute up over here. Okay, we'll be right back after these messages. Oh, come on. Now, what's going on here? Okay, here we go. Okay, there you go.
rodeo of doom. Okay, welcome back to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator, Ed Opperman. We're here with Jay Dyer, and he's the author of the upcoming book, uh, Esoteric Hollywood, and he runs the website, jaysanalysis.com, where he has all these articles about this kind of stuff, and uh, also to a, a podcast that you can subscribe to and, and listen to. So, Jay, you still there? I am. Now, okay, so now we were going over, uh, I can understand the motivation, for the CIA and you know the you know them that crowd, <laughs> you know what I mean to want to brainwash us and have a what do you call it the propaganda. Sure. And I can understand too the the whole sex thing and the prostitution and escorts back you know that, that goes on. But now, what is the motivation on such a grand level of all this occult activity, like when you got the Super Bowl and the Grammys and all that kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. What do you got? Well, I would say that you have, in the, if you look historically, you know, back to ancient cultures, religions, the elite, uh, you know, the upper crust, you know, they generally took on the attitude of believing themselves to be divine or semi-divine, right? They, they had a demigod status, and this was something that was projected to, you know, the masses. And it was, mm -hmm. really, you know, the, really the priest class that was involved in that and helped uh, prop that up. And quite often, you know, these cultures, I believe, would uh, d delve into uh, human sacrifice. And, you know, the ancient view uh, of why there would be human sacrifice, you have to understand that ancient man uh, didn't see the world as we do post-enlightenment. So they saw what's what I mentioned before, a correspondence or associations between things having a real connection. So, you know, the planet Mercury would have a real association or connection to you know, uh, that the metal mercury, right? Uh, the element. Uh, so there, there would, there's a real, uh, subtle plane, right. That undergirds reality, the ether, uh, in Greek metaphysics, uh, that connects things, uh, outside of space and time. And so they have, uh, it's believed to have a, I guess you'd call it a magical correspondence. And this is really the foundation or what undergirds all ancient, uh, and even medieval religious practice across the board. And so they had a completely different cosmology, a completely different worldview. And, you know, when you combine that with, you know, the, the, the idea of the upper, upper class, upper crust, uh, viewing themselves in this divine way, then it, it, they're kind of like the top of the food chain. Right? And so the underclass, the masses, whatever, they're viewed as uh, cattle, as food, as, you know, basically a parasitical elite uh, feeds on them, uh, propping up the mythology that they are divine. And, uh, you know, whatever your view of ancient religion, whether you believe in spirits or ghosts or God or not, that's at least a fact of anthropology that that's how culture has functioned. And I believe that a lot of people, even in the modern world, uh, still have this view. Now, granted, there are plenty of uh, upper crust elites who are just rank atheists who don't believe anything, and it's pure pragmatic power politics. But I think you have uh, a good portion who do believe in the reality of uh, magic, of uh, the occult, 
different strands, different tastes, whatever, uh, voodoo, Crowley, all that stuff. There are people who, who do take it serious. And, you know, if you read enough, I'm sure you've read a good bit on it, uh, given your profession. Uh, in my own research, uh, you know, at university and so forth, uh, you know, you can find plenty of mainstream works that deal with uh, ritual murder. Uh, and this, I think, shows the uh, reality to, you know, there are people who believe this and they take it very seriously. Uh, cannibalism is something that, that some people do take seriously, as, uh, you know, far-fetched and crazy as that sounds. So were there ever, you know, hyped up uh, versions of the satanic panic in the 80s? Yeah, probably. But that doesn't mean that none of this is real. And, you know, there's plenty of, I think, examples. The Dutro affair, I mean, you can just go on and on. Franklin Coverup, uh, you know, th these are examples of instances where we get, I think, a picture into where this, this really does go on. And there's a lot of baloney out there. There's a lot of stuff, you know, the circle, the satanic circle of the nine or whatever that, you know, that was being promoted as a bunch of baloney. Uh, but that could even be subterfuge to cover up real crimes. Uh, you know, we know the situation with Savile, things like this. So the, these are all real things. Uh, and so a long-winded answer to your, to your question is that uh, if you have that worldview, it, it doesn't just pertain to, uh, you know, some side thing you might do on a solstice or something. It's a, a, a view that is all-encompassing about reality. And so everything is viewed in this, quote, magical way. And that would mean then that pretty much if you're an artist, a director, a producer, whatever, whatever you're involved in is viewed as an aspect of your magical working. And so the workings that you create uh, are viewed as a means by which you attain power. And the, and the attaining of power in this view includes the notion of doing your artwork or working your art in such a way that uh, you influence the minds and perception of others to view you in a certain way or to transfer their time, focus, thought, energy towards you. Uh, and, you know, if you think of the uh, Black Dahlia case. You know, I know much has been written about this. But if you, you know, you look at Steve Hodell and uh, George Hodell uh, and the idea of surrealist art uh, and Man Ray and all that whole stuff, you know, you know yeah. long, big long rabbit hole that uh, the whole idea of surrealism uh, ties into this. You could, see, in other words, if you have a surrealist view of art and life, it's actually a worldview where you believe that the waking state is a dream state. You'll find this to be the case of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, many of the serial killers had this notion of, oh, no, I, I didn't know when I was awake, when I was dreaming, I you know dissociation and so forth. And if life is a dream state, then, uh, you know, nothing wrong with ritual murders, right? I mean, it's, nothing matters. It's, it's a dream state. It doesn't really matter. It's not real. It's Maya, illusion, you know, in Far Eastern thought. Uh, and so, you know, you, you see this presented in, uh, for example, David Lynch films. Uh, I've, I've watched all of his movies uh, many times over the years. I've done several in-depth analyses of his films. And what you'll see, if you watch interviews with David Lynch, he talks about it. You know, he, he's ahead of the... Uh, Transcendental Meditation, uh, the Lynch Foundation promotes Transcendental Meditation. That ties back into the Beatles and the Tavistock Institute and things I mentioned earlier. A lot of mind control type stuff. Uh, but what you'll see is the presentation in his films is all uh, surrealism. Now, um, I'm just giving this as an example. Uh, in, you know, in interviews, he'll say, you know, what I'm doing when I'm meditating is I'm going into uh, the inner world, the ether, whatever, uh, that realm of the potential, the imaginative, and I'm conjuring out of that realm uh, and receiving impressions that I'm then going to bring into the conscious realm, the conscious state, to basically enact my uh, subconscious, my dream realm, into the visible realm, right? And so, in other words, this is viewed as an actual magical working. And you can actually read, you know, the, the works of uh, the high-level uh, uh, ritual magicians and so forth, and they talk this way. So when I see the uh, big time directors and producers talking the exact same way as, you know, the, these uh, so-called magicians, uh, I, I don't doubt that there's a direct connection. And, you know, you look at things like voodoo or shamanism. Uh, that's the idea of shamanism. You know, the, 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 the shaman is a conduit for uh, what's coming through the so-called uh, spiritual realm, spiritual plane, you know, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it it's all the same notion. Right. It's all, it always boils down to the same idea of this sort of transference of energy through uh, symbolic ritual and action. And really a movie, you, you could start to see why a movie could be viewed that way. A movie is a kind of uh, 
symbolic artistic pres- presentation of uh, you know, unreal events that are then made real in a way. And even the way it's presented, you go into this dark theater and you sit there and you wait for this big magnificent screen to turn it's on. It's almost like a temple, yeah. Well, and you go back to ancient Greece, you know, the, the rise of the theater. And in ancient Greece, you know, you go back and read the uh, Sophocles and these you know, different playwrights, and it's 100% connected to the divine. And for them, it was a religious, what's called dramaturgy, a drama, uh, dramatic liturgical presentation. Uh, it, you know, if, you, if anybody knows about, you know, like Catholicism or any of the Western religions, you have what's called liturgy, which is just the ritual enactment of the service. And the, the belief in this worldview is in a way similar in so far as the idea is that all of your life is liturgy. It's a ritual enactment. Okay, that's fascinating. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. And you know, there, but, there, uh, there's one example, sorry to interrupt, but uh, if, you, if anyone doubts me of this, uh, go read the Platonic Dialogue Ion. I-O-N. Uh, you can find this. It's not very long. It's a few pages. Uh, you find this uh, easily online, you know, publicly with different university sites. And in the dialogue Ion, uh, Plato and Socrates, ha- Socrates has a dialogue with artists and actors. And he talks about, you know, who's a real artist, who's, you know, what's not. And <laughs> there's this lengthy discussion of uh, the Greek idea of uh, plays and uh, the invocation of the gods through acting. Now, I'm not saying that that means that it's true or is necessarily really happening. I'm just saying that a lot of people have this view, right? So there's a difference between the, an anthropological approach of looking at what people think and how they view these things as opposed to saying, oh, this is definitely true or not true, right? I mean, could, if, if you're out there and you're agnostic or atheist or whatever, you say, oh, I don't believe in this mumbo-jumbo, it doesn't matter. A lot of people don't what I'm trying to say. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. A couple of things, because I'm from New York, you know? And um, maybe you can tell, <laughs> but uh, what do you call it? the people in the theater in New York on Broadway? They treat that as a like a temple, you know. They they they, oh, yeah. they consider it a magical uh, theater, you know, an experience, a, a, a religious experience. It is. I did an interview with a girl who uh, she, she moved from New York to I believe England, uh, but she's a Shakespearean actress, and you know she did I think her grad work in uh, Shakespearean theater and. She went into great detail about this, and she was like, "Yeah, this is all for me. It, it's uh, <laughs> it's religious. It's ceremonial. I, I take it very serious." Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and this goes back to Shakespeare as well, too. And some people think that speculate that Shakespeare was a spy. And, and you see, the, the the Shakespeare themes are reused over and over and over again in in, in recent movies and current movies and and even TV shows and stuff. Yeah, like, uh, like, that's interesting because uh, you know you have the Globe Theater, right, and the, the, the the idea in, in different Shakespearean plays is that we're all, you know, actors on the stage of the world or whatever. But Shakespeare, uh, you know, whether it was a collection of people or one guy, who knows? Um, it, it's there's absolutely no question that it's full of, uh, you know, these all these hermetic principles and alchemical principles, which were very much in vogue in Elizabethan uh, England. Uh, you can read the plays of uh, uh, or the poems of uh, John Donne or Ben Jonson. I have plenty of analyses of all those, you know, illustrating all this very stuff at my site. And that's, you know, Shakespeare kind of wrote the English language, uh, you know, at least in terms of the modern world. And so, you know, you, you can see why these connections would be made. But, uh, you know, for those who study uh, particularly Western Hermeticism, Shakespeare is very important because he encoded a lot of that in his plays. And, you know, Hollywood is a direct outworking of, you know, the British cinema and British theater. So, you know, you can see you can see the parallels, obviously. You know, it's funny. You mentioned uh, Steve Hodel before. Mm-hmm. You know, he had swapped wives with uh, John Huston. Exactly. Yeah, and they they were roughly in that in that canyon world. set that uh, Dave McGowan's book discusses at length. Yeah, and then uh, Steve Hodel's sister, who just recently died, by the way, Tamar. Yeah, Tamar. Yeah, she wound up there over at the Papa John Phillips house, right? Oh yeah. I mean, that, <laughs> yeah, I, I read uh, uh, Dave McGowan's book with uh, you know with uh, just total in uh, fixation <laughs> I mean I just I, my the whole book's underlined I've got you know like a million notes in here but uh, you know it's a great example of uh, you know ritual murder and film right I mean you, you've got movies made about this uh, more than one uh, at least one major uh, production at least uh, give with uh, Brian De Palma 
And then you've got some, you know, you know, the versions of it. But, uh, the, you know, this is a ritual murder that uh, I think ties directly into, you know, a lot of high level people in Hollywood. Uh, and, the, you know, this this uh, Laurel Canyon story just goes on and on and on. I, I listened to the broadcast you did with Dave McGowan back in, I think, uh, November 2014. And I thought it was a, a great discussion. And he was, you know, reminding me of the, the whole Lookout Mountain studio. You know, here's a, a, right. the best examples of, you know, this massive studio uh, uh, under the aegis of the Air Force. Uh, that produced uh, supposedly several thousand films, and you know you got Jimmy Stewart, Walt Disney, Marilyn Monroe, Bob Hope. All these people have access to this uh, top secret facility where the uh, Atomic Energy Commission filmed the uh, supposed atomic explosion videos. Uh, so I mean, there's really no end to that rabbit hole either. And curiously, uh, that facility is now owned by Jared Leto. I don't know what to make of that, but it's, it's just interesting. But uh, yeah, I enjoyed that conversation you had. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's a massive secret bunker, right? Um, yeah. Um, and uh, so that, I mean, that's a awesome example. I can't think of a better example of you know the stuff that I deal with than that very thing right there. <laughs> you know, look out, Mountain Studios. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, but now, but um, you mentioned uh, again the uh, Black Dahlia. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you done any work on the movie Pretty Woman? Uh, no, but uh, it's funny you said that because <clears throat> I get a lot of emails you know, quite consistently with people <laughs> saying, please do this movie, please do this movie. Uh, and somebody has asked me to do that, but uh, you know, I, I haven't seen it since it came out, and it, it's not one that's really been, been on my radar. But uh, you know, the more you do this, the more you, you get into it. Everything, you, you see it again in, in a new light. You know, some dumb movie you watched 10 years ago, you watch it again, and you're like, holy shit, you know, this is, like, this is full, of, full of stuff I miss. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, 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 I know exactly what you're talking about. You go back and see an old movie and say, I can't believe I missed this. You know, this is amazing. But did you know that in the movie Pretty Woman, uh, in that scene, the, at the end, on the fire escape, where he goes up there, you know, mm-hmm. that's, uh, Black Dahlia? What's short? What's it name? Elizabeth Short? Elizabeth Short. That's her apartment in real life. Wow, no, I did not. That's her apartment, man. <laughs> where the window where, uh, that woman, a pretty woman, is sticking her head out. That's her apartment. Well, you know, there's an, an interesting connection between what's called noir or neo-noir film and the esoteric or the occult, which probably most people wouldn't make that connection. You think of Dashiell Hammett or Raymond Chandler, you know, these different writers, and then you think of Humphrey Bogart. Uh, but when you watch a lot of these films, you start to notice that they're actually hinting at and telling you quite a bit as well. So uh, the... Uh, for example, there's a curious scene in the Black Dahlia film that mimics uh, the, uh, is it uh, Glass Key? Uh, w- one of the bogey films where there's a, he, he, he discovers this secret, uh, the general's daughter is like running off to uh, do drugs and, and uh, participate in pornography. But they can't really show that back, you know, in like the 40s or 50s. <laughs> it's The Big Sleep, that's what it is, 1946 film, Big Sleep. There's this scene that is directly parallel to the scene in the Black Dahlia where they're filming these, uh, you know, high-end, uh, you know, porn films and uh, I guess snuff films or whatever. Uh, and, and just curious that you know that you, that you see this even you know back in the 1946 film Big Sleep. Most people probably didn't know that or, or hadn't hadn't paid attention to that. But there's a direct connection between those two films. Very interesting. I'd have to go back and take a look at that. Okay, this might be a good time to take a break. We're with um, uh, Jay Dyer. He's the author of the book Esoteric Hollywood and also the website jaysanalysis.com. So we'll be right back after these messages with more of Jay Dyer.
Okay, welcome back to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman, and we're here tonight with Jay Dyer, uh, author of the book Esoteric Hollywood, and also the website jaysanalysis.com. Uh, Jay, earlier we were talking about uh, voodoo and shamans and stuff like that. Just recently I had a guest on the show called uh, Brendy Richards, and she's from South Africa. And she was describing about how, you know, the the new government down there, the ANC, they made these witch doctors and these voodoo doctors, they made them official doctors down there. They gave them honorary official doctor degrees. And, you know, they can write doctor's notes and all kinds of stuff. They can diagnose people legally. And one of the things they do is, uh, you know, they have these concoctions of animal blood and brain and bone uh, and even human blood and human, uh, they, do, they do human decapitations down there, and they include the human blood and human brain in this concoction. And one of the people who went down there and participated in one of these ceremonies was Michael Jackson. Have you heard about that? I have, yes. You have? Okay, what do you know about that? Well, I mean, I'm not like an authority on Michael Jackson. I have uh, Bulgangiari or whatever his name is, uh, Tabarelli, I forget the guy's name, but that biography on Michael Jackson uh, I've read a good bit of. Um, you know, I follow Jackson here and there, but, uh, you know, I, I don't really know the total prominence of his uh, interest in the occult or esoteric, but there's definitely something to it given his fascinations with Pan and, Peter Pan and and, and, uh, and thinking that I believe he thought he was kind of like an incarnation of Mercury and he had paintings commissioned of him as like Apollo or Mercury or I can't, I can't recall but but uh, you know the, I'm glad you mentioned uh, the the situation in places like uh, Africa or you can look at uh, Haiti or the Congo right. uh, you look at Papa Doc Duvalier right I mean right. I mean this is an openly uh, Vodun. Uh, president and and you know, this is he was the leader of Haiti for many years and uh, his son I believe now is the president and is also uh, openly Vodun. Uh, so uh, he, what's also curious is the picture of Papa Doc Duvalier hanging out with uh, Jay Rockefeller. <laughs> oh really? Uh, yeah, just uh, Google that you can find that it comes up pretty easy. But uh, I've always f found that uh, curious. So uh, that's relevant because that shows the, the reality of, uh, you know, the intersection between the occult and the state uh, may not be something that we think of as a norm in the Western world. But in a lot of the world, that still is the norm. So it's a great example. I, I'm, I'm really glad you, you brought that up. And actually, if you watch the film Live and Let Die, uh, which is faithful to the Ian Fleming novel, uh, you will find Baron Samidi. Uh, who is an actual, uh, uh, what do they call him, uh, Obey or, or Veve, uh, that's invoked uh, uh, in Vodun and in Haiti, the Congo. Um, you'll find Baron Samidi uh, figures prominently into Fleming's novel because he wrote it based on experiences that he uh, got uh, traveling traveling there as well as uh, firsthand accounts from uh, different international authorities uh, where he was looking at the illegal drug and gold trade. Uh, back in the 60s and 70s. So really fascinating stuff. But it, you, if you look, if you watch that movie, Live and Let Die, with Roger Moore, it's kind of cheesy, but as, as all the uh, Roger Moore bonds are, uh, you'll find that there's actually quite a bit that's true in that, where they actually you know, there's actually human sacrifice that's going to uh, happen. Bond, of course, thwarts it. Uh, but yeah, you've got Bodoons, you've got Baron Samiti, you've got tarot cards, you've got all of that in uh, Live and Let Die, just to bring it back to Bond. Yeah, are you are you aware of anything about the Clintons going down to Haiti and doing rituals down there? Uh, I know that uh, Hillary has flirted here and there with being blessed by Native American spirit spiritists. Um, I know she's made some other New Agey type statements, but uh, as for the for that, no, I, I hadn't heard that. Uh, however, uh, interestingly enough, curious synchronicity. You it makes me think of uh, the. Umberto Eco novel Foucault's Pendulum, which is a pretty famous novel, bestseller, um, last, I don't know, 15 years or so. And in that novel, you have the treatment of uh, elites who actually do go and participate in uh, quite a few voodoo ceremonies. 
Uh, and uh, Umberto Eco is no small player. He's curiously also a bondologist. He wrote the first critical essay that would actually uh, move Ian Fleming into the ranks of being considered an actual good writer, not just a pulp writer. So you had this famous essay by Umberto Eco, uh, who uh, I should mention, he, he's an Italian author and semiotician. Semiotics is the study of signs and symbols. He just passed away today, apparently. Yeah. Oh, really? And uh, Echo wrote a novel where you have elites uh, participating in voodoo. Isn't that interesting? It is interesting. Uh, that uh, same novel is also uh, full of uh, Kabbalistic uh, uh, thought as well. What about now? A couple of things about back to Africa again. There, there's an episode two of Amazing Race where they made the contestants drink that stuff as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, but one more thing is that uh, what do you know about Steven Spielberg going down there and doing one of these, uh, witnessing one of these ceremonies? Uh, well, I, the story I heard was that, uh, you know, Jacko thought Spielberg put a curse okay. on him. Okay. And then Jacko turned around and, I mean, I don't know what's I'm just saying what I remember reading, you know, maybe 10 years ago. Right. And then uh, Jacko hired uh, a voodoo priestess to, I think, sacrifice a red herring or a bull or something like that to, to count. To counter the effects, I don't know. I don't I have no idea if that's true or not. You know, I've heard that story, but right. I, I wouldn't be surprised because a lot of people who uh, do get interested in esoteric occult stuff, what they do is you know they go try these uh, different cult groups, uh, or they you know read about Golden Dawn or Crowley and that kind of stuff, and then they start to realize, oh, maybe maybe the ancient you know true spiritism is animism, right? And so a lot of people go from that stuff into just straight up voodoo and, anim and, and animism. <clears throat> and so I could see the direct connect there. And that's where you would get into the human sacrifice component for sure. Uh, and, uh, oh, it made me think of, I was going to tell you about it. Uh, well, there's a movie with Martin Sheen. Uh, right. It's going to ask about the believers. Yeah. Believers, uh, I was going to say yeah. the believers, uh, the skeleton, yeah. skeleton key with, um, uh, Oh, what's her face? Launch it. Kate Hudson. Uh, there's, um, Serpent and the Rainbow. You know, these, these are interesting. Angel Heart with Robert De Niro. <laughs> these are, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> interesting uh, voodoo themed movies, which I actually will be doing a show on pretty soon. But, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, occult magician types, Crowley, they're, they're borrowing from these kinds of ancient practices. So you could see why they would, you know, Crowley talks about, I think, removing the heart and eating the heart and stuff like that. Uh, and that's straight out of voodoo. So. Yeah, Idi Amin uh, supposedly uh, killed one of his enemies and ate his heart. Yeah, I watched a documentary on Liberia, and, uh, and uh, this goes on in Liberia now. Uh, you know, the, the, when the warlord uh, defeats his enemy, whoever, they eat the heart. And this is just considered, you know, the normative practice. So now, what do you think? Do, do you think they get power from this, that there's power in this uh, blood sacrifice? Well, I would say, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I you know, you call me superstitious, but you know, I, I do believe in the reality of the spiritual realm. Um, I do believe, you know, God exists, and I think that uh, there is something to this, or you would, or you would, it wouldn't be something that's a perennial practice of uh, you know the nations. And uh, you know, this one reason I think that the you know, Bible, for example, forbids doing it is just because it. It, it leads to such a degeneracy. Um, you know, it's, it's an idolatrous practice, but it's also harmful to the social order. Um, but, you know, some people do take it serious, and you, know, you have uh, biblical stories where this is going on. So, I guess uh, you know, what, it depends on what your your worldview is. But uh, yeah, I would say that it does. Uh, I don't think that it ultimately gives a person, uh, you know, satisfaction or fulfillment or anything like that. But I wouldn't. Uh, be surprised if it didn't, you know, grant some sort of uh, temporal uh, right. spate of power, perhaps. As I certainly think that that's a, a possibility. Yeah, and like especially when you look at, we were talking off the air about the West Memphis Three and, and Eccles. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe that uh, whatever ritual he did, you know, with the, the original murders, and then whatever he's doing now, uh, he's gotten this ability to lie to people and get them to believe his lies. And also to get other people to lie for him. Uh, and uh, there's another theory I have, too, that he's telling people that he's a, a reincarnation or an, an, uh, 
an offspring of Crowley, because he does look a lot like Crowley. I don't know if you ever saw of his younger pictures, uh, but he does look like a young Crowley. Uh, what do you what do you make of that? Uh, I, I mean, I, I've seen a few documentaries, uh, read a few articles. I, I, I certainly wouldn't call myself uh, any kind of authority on that that case. I, I don't. I mean, I've heard some shows, the shows you've done. Um, you know, it does look like that guy's in the occult. Um, you know, but I, I don't really consider myself really knowledgeable enough on the, the whole thing to to comment with any relevance. But uh, certainly, you know, if if he is uh, involved in the occult, it would suggest that you know he's taking the the human sacrifice aspect of it seriously in terms of like the Crowley and stuff. Yeah, it seems to me that he has some followers that are definitely occultists as well, equal to him. You know, they're they're right. full blown. You know, they're in this. Uh, but then you have another bunch that are just this naive, gullible bunch yeah. that just believe it. You know, and but but they're willing to lie for him. And they all there's this undercurrent between the whole bunch of these followers of this arrogance, this rudeness, uh, this insulting nature. Uh, just the it's I've never seen. Well, I can't say I've never seen anything like it before. But it's it's unique to that group and to other certain groups that, that again touches on the same kind of a, a cult. Uh, there's a certain attitude that, that, that it breeds in these but, groups. Yeah, yeah, I, I've been to uh, the site where uh, uh, back when I was in high school is when the the Murray vampire killers of Murray, Kentucky, when they had their uh, spate of uh, I think they killed two or three people. But uh, Rod Farrell and his girlfriend. Uh, uh, that was a big deal, you know. It was when I was in high school, everybody knew about the ritual murder that happened. But uh, you know, that's a, that's a, another case of uh, something similar to what you're describing with the West Memphis Three, where you have this kind of homegrown. Maybe I don't know. You know, yeah, you know, it's a homegrown organic thing, or if the guy was, uh, you know, maybe had other people uh, higher level directing him. I, I don't know. But uh, you know, Rod Farrell obviously took it seriously. You know, he was reading Crowley. He was reading. LaVey and so forth, and, you know, he thought he was some sort of uh, reincarnated vampire. He thought he couldn't die. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, he took the uh, the, uh, the uh, feeling seriously. And, you know, I've, I've seen enough people messed up on drugs, LSD, and a lot of times people who are involved in ritual magic and, and the occult, they will add, you know, a lot of them will take drugs, LSD, to enhance the, you know, perceived spiritual perception I guess you could say uh, of the spiritual realm, uh, and I think that uh, you know, uh, I've seen enough people. I've never been involved in anything occult or anything like that. But I'm saying, you know, back when I was a teenager, you go out people that are partying or whatnot. I've seen enough people get messed up that you know I've seen other things take over where that person was no longer there and something else was <laughs> running that machine. Yeah, right. Uh, and that to me would suggest the reality of uh, you know of possession. And I think that that's what you're seeing in these. Not obviously not in every case, but in, in the case of these people like Rod Farrell, uh, you know, I, I think they really are uh, possessed by a spirit that you know, you know fools them into believing that they have powers, that they're immortal. You know, well, obviously Rod Farrell's not immortal. You know, he, he's uh, he's going to die, right? So. Uh, yeah, that's. Uh, I just always go back to you know a lot of. It's not popular, I don't guess, in the modern world to talk about the Bible, but you know the Bible talks about a lot of this. The Bible talks about Lucifer as a con artist, and that's what he does. He comes as an angel of light and tells you that you're going to get power, you're going to get immortality, uh, and it's a con, it's a ruse, uh, and that's that's kind of what the devil's known for. But even if you don't believe in the devil, a lot of people take it serious, and that's really kind of the point I've been trying to drive home. Yeah, I'm I'm a Christian, mm -hmm. and a lot of my audience is Christian. They 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 have no problem, you know. Uh, you don't have to worry about <laughs> you know say that stuff. No one's uh, offended here by that kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, oh, it's amazing too. You can't talk about this in many churches. Uh, they don't even want to go near any of this kind of topic. You know. I got a question for you, Ed. Go ahead. I uh, another Tennessee case. Uh, did you follow any of the Holly Bobo case? Holly Bobo, uh, remind me. I did. I did. Yes, I did. I did. Yes. Well, okay. There was such uh, so many oddities and weirdness around that that it almost looked like it was kind of a human trafficking kind of thing. And then supposedly they found her skull, uh, you know, severed from the body. And <laughs> I mean, that to me seems so strange. And that's another big one here in Tennessee. Uh, I, I just wondered if you had any input on that. To me, it sounded. I mean, I don't know because I didn't really dive into it or follow it intently. 
Uh, but you know, to me, it kind of had what you know earmarks, I guess, of what sounded like ritual murder or at least human trafficking. Well, yeah, there's a lot in that. Uh, it's not fresh on my mind at the moment, but I recall that uh, like there was a drug gang, mm-hmm. you know, that was a uh, of brothers and cousins and stuff like that that was notorious down there. That everyone was afraid of them. Right. And and even when they when they arrested a couple of these guys, you know. I, what wasn't parts of the body found like in a creek right by their house and stuff? Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it's like one of those cases where it's like all well, the cops know who did it, you know, but they're afraid to go after him. Yeah, and there were a lot of high high level high officials level. involved in the case, which is curious too. And I always always wonder, maybe you, uh, given your profession, might have some insight on this. You know, why is it that the mass media? I know that part of its ratings. But I also think there's uh, some sort of psychological warfare aspect to it as, as to why certain murders or stories are chosen to be the only thing that the whole nation is going to talk about for a month or two or three. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. that's Why good... is it that case? Why are we talking about Natalie? I mean, there's plenty of people who have been killed, but we're talking about Natalie Holloway for months, right? Right. And, and I, I know some of these people, you know, producers who work with these, you know, the big ones, you know, like, Top mom, top mom. <laughs> you know? Like I, I know people, you know, very well connected to them, and I don't think that they. I think they're naive, uh, whatever their involvement is in, in perpetuating these big stories. Uh, I, I don't think. I think they're out of the loop. They're definitely not in on the the, the bigger picture, uh, and they're just kind of they, they they're kind of not bright people, you know, is what I'm finding. A lot of these people in the media. Well, can uh, people in the background is what I wonder because you know, like you see these. Um... I'm sure you've seen the Conan clip of, uh, you know, like the local news people yeah. all reading the exact same script, which I assume is, you know, coming from some central locale. right? Yeah, there, there's a lot of that. You know, I've been covering the elections, you know, and, and when you show up down there at these rallies and stuff like that, I was just covering the, the Battlehorn, uh, Battleborn uh, dinner last night with both Bernie and uh, Hillary were there. When, when you show up, they give you a, a handout, you know, you give you a piece of paper. This is what you're supposed to report tonight. Uh, and everyone seems to go along with it. Uh, and they're Talk a bunch points, of points, basically. Yeah, and uh, all the reporters are very, very lazy people. They're they're not very interested in finding anything out. <laughs> you know, they're just kind of happy to just be there and you know and type into their little laptops so whatever they're told to do. Well, you go back to to the founding of thing of you know the big three networks, and that's all a bunch of people that work for OSS. Yeah, yeah. You know, RKO Pictures uh, that was uh, started by. Um, uh, Kennedy Senior, and then it was taken over by the uh, Rockefellers. Yeah, now you got uh, Fox, Rupert Mur- Murdoch running everything. Uh, but now we were talking about the um, the believers. Uh-huh. Okay, now I've heard that that's a, an important film to these occultists. W- what do you know about that? Uh, well, I mean, you, 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 I suppose there's some movies, you know, like uh, certain like, occult groups will list, you know, like you need to see this movie, we like this, we approve it, or whatever. Uh, I, I, it's news to me that if that, if that is like a important film per se, um, but I do think it shows a lot of insights, uh, which is, you know, kind of what I focus on and what you see there is, uh, Martin Sheen's playing this character whose, uh, family actually is uh, wrapped up in this elite cult, uh, and, uh, you know, the, the billionaire, whatever guy, you know, runs the cult and it's voodoo and they take it very seriously. And then, you know, that they even uh, utilize ritual murder under the cover of uh, runaway and drug treatment program, uh, which actually reminds me of uh, Franklin cover up. Right. With Boys Town, uh, you know, shipping the boys uh, to the White House and, you know, even worse, nefarious things with Larry King. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's kind of a parallel to the Franklin cover up in uh, the film The Believers. But but, yeah, that's another one that's very insightful. There's a B movie, too, that. It's along the same lines called society, and it deals with the exact same themes. Because okay, what I heard was you're familiar with Matamoros, Mexico, that big case on there. Uh, is this uh, like the, where the uh, like MS13, the cartels, where they kind of ritual kills? I wish I'm not. Yeah, and it wasn't cartels. It was a drug gang down in Matamoros, Mexico. It was a, it was a, an occult uh, drug gang. Okay. And and they they, they got caught because they killed two uh, American tour uh, college kids. But uh, they had been killing people down there for a long time. Was it was a, to Santa Muerte? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I never talked and what that. I heard was is those guys were all into that movie, The Believers. Oh, wow. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, they made a remake. They No, they made a movie 
and it's almost impossible to get this movie. Uh, Rosie Perez is in it, and it's usually uh, in Spanish only, and it's about Madame Morris. It's a really, really fa- – have you ever seen that movie? Uh, which one again? Okay, I don't know the name of it. Uh, it's No, yes, it's either called Running with the Devil or Dancing with the Devil, something like that, and it has a Spanish name to it. Even though I've seen it in English, there's a Spanish version you can find on Put Locker and stuff. Rosie Perez is in it, and some Mexican actor who's not from America, he's from South America someplace, uh, and no other big stars at all. But Rosie Perez is in it, she looks really freaky in it, too. Uh, and it's all about Madame Morris. You know what I'm... What I'm uh, I, okay, I got you now. No, no, I haven't seen that. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me, though, it sounds kind of like the... Uh, the was the, the Tony Scott film with uh, Denzel Washington... Uh, out of right. out of time, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but uh, that is also a human uh, traffic uh, in the Santa Morte uh, cult as well. Uh, man, man on fire. That's it. Right, 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 right. So actually, it's interesting. I think uh, a lot of films will deal with this reality that you're talking about, and uh, there's a good. Uh, mil- I think it's one of the uh, uh, military intelligence document that I have cited in one of my articles that is a pretty lengthy treatment uh, of the MS-13 and Santa Morte. Um, I'd have to dig to find it. I don't recall off the top of my head. But, but yeah, all that's real. And that, by the way, comes up uh, briefly in the new film Sicario, where you have Emily Blunt being this kind of naive uh, FBI girl uh, who's all, you know, pro-America. And then she realizes that the, the elite uh, attache unit that she's a she's an attache to this uh, elite unit of special forces guys that is actually helping out one of the cartels <laughs> yeah right <laughs> so uh and there are actual there's some references to uh santa muerte and uh you know ms-13 and that as well yeah um now have you looked into uh any of maury terry's work with son of sam and all that i have i've read uh, ultimate evil yeah so, so what do you make of that? Uh, I don't doubt that you know that that the, that those are real ritual killings. Um, some of these cases, I'm sure, you, as you know, you know, like the uh, West Memphis, Memphis Three, you, you kind of have to take a year to read all the relevant material to really to be up on the um, up on the ball. Uh, but uh, you know, I've read some books on Zodiac and uh, Berkowitz and all that. Um, but, you know, just kind of in a cursory treatment, a book here and there. Um, or, you know, I read Terry, I have read uh, Peter Lavenda's books. Um, and I don't doubt that the, that there's a real uh, component to that. Um, I think some of the analysis that Terry does of the Twilight language or synchronicities is a, is a little fuzzy. It's a, it's a little hard to substantiate some of that. He's, I think he's kind of reaching in some places there. Uh, but he's definitely onto something. Oh, Yeah. But why don't you think there's ever been a movie ever about Son of Sam that, that even touches on this, this cult aspect, the satanic cult aspect? None of it, ever. Uh, well, wasn't there, wasn't there one uh, uh, with uh, didn't John Leguizamo and he, and he in a Son of Sam movie? Yeah, that doesn't touch on any cult stuff uh, at all. I was trying to remember it. It's been a long time since I watched that. Yeah, that was a Spike Lee movie. Okay. Yeah, with John Leguizamo and uh, also that other guy from Christopher from The Sopranos. He's in it, too. Okay. Uh, and, uh, but, yeah, but they don't touch on the occult stuff at all in there. They, they say he's a crazy guy that heard the dog talking. Huh. <laughs> didn't, uh, what was, wasn't one of the big senators, uh, Feinstein or Boxer, did, didn't they pardon or, or do something for the, uh, uh, what's the uh, guy out in California, the, uh... <laughs> Zo- yeah, the, the Zodiac. No, not the Zodiac. The other one, um, Richard Ramirez. Uh, did Oh, really? Yeah, did one of them tried to give him a, a pardon or tried to lighten a sentence or something like that? Oh, really? You know, I had um, uh, this woman on the show, uh, Benetsky, uh, who was on my show, who was a pen pal with uh, Ramirez. Oh, wow. Yeah, she talked. She used to talk to him on her phone you know, almost daily, mm-hmm. and it was really weird. You know, you gotta, yeah, it's in the member section. Uh, he would say to her, "Tell me what's on your refrigerator. Tell me what's uh, on, you know, what's on your wall. Tell me what's in your refrigerator. What's in your cabinets. You know, walk around your kitchen. Tell me what's inside. You know, what's what's on the stove right now. That's what he would want to talk about from the from the payphone in prison." Uh, what do you make of that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but she, I asked her, "Did you ever ask him about the the occult significance? You know, of his crimes?" 
And she says, oh, yeah, yeah, he admitted it all that it was. But he was just very nonchalant about that part. Oh, yeah, it was in service to Satan. Yeah, well, you know how to do these rituals. It had to be done. That kind of stuff. Interesting. I, uh, I read, too, about uh, Richard Chase, the uh, Sacramento vampire. And, uh, you know, his, his story uh, reads like possession as well, uh, in, in my opinion. I don't know if you've looked at that one very much. Yeah, I had a guest on who, who uh, did that, uh, Kevin Sullivan. He did uh, the Bundy book, and he also did a book about the Chase, the vampire guy. Um, very, uh, you know what? And uh, he describes, too, in his book and on the show, uh, a very weird experience. He had like a supernatural experience when he first showed up there uh, to start working on the book. I forget what it was, but it was something very, very odd that really moved him a lot because he, he, he talked about it a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was something that really freaked him out. But back again to that story with the um, Kelly Bonansky and uh, Richard Ramirez, because the reason why I invited her on my show is because she had a neighbor who was uh, into the occult and he was a Satanist and he was fascinated with Ramirez. So when she would get a, a letter from Ramirez, he would say, "Let me see the envelope," and he would lick the envelope where Ramirez had licked it. Says, "I licked, you know, the same saliva that he has." He was really into that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but wait, it gets better, man. <laughs> Oh, we get it. Yeah, this guy, he didn't have a car, so he got a, a ride to the liquor store with a friend of his, some girl. They pick up some drunk woman who ran away from her family. She had six kids, and she was an alcoholic. She was just wandering the country. They picked her up at the liquor store, took her back to his. He was living in the garage at his parents' house. The 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 girl that gives him a ride, she takes off and leaves. He kills this woman in his uh, parents' garage where he was living. Eats, eats part of her, has sex with the dead body, and then there's blood everywhere. He's walking in and out of the house, covered in blood, going to the bathroom, cleaning up, chopping up this body, and taking it out to the backyard, burning it in a fire pit. Now, the only reason he got caught is because he had a friend that was a neighbor and says, hey, you know how we always talked about capturing somebody and killing them and putting them in a the fire pit? I just did it. Come on over and look. And the neighbor turned him in. But his parents never got arrested. This guy's walking in and out of there with a dead bo with, 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 with body parts. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh, my God. I don't even know what to say. I uh, I did an analysis. It makes me think of uh, uh, True Detective Season 1, and I did an analysis yeah. of that. And that is actually based on uh, a real Louisiana church that was uh, directly involved in uh, a, a Crowleyan-flavored uh, cult thing where they... Uh, we're involved in human trafficking and uh, underage uh, pedo yeah. stuff as well as sex. You can find that in my uh, True Detective Analysis uh, Season 1. But that's a, another example, right? And they're using right. this uh, evangelical church as a front, uh, which which uh, we saw in the, in the Franklin situation as well, if I recall. I, uh, Bo Boys Town is a Catholic thing, but uh, I think it tied into – so did it, didn't it tie into other, other uh, so-called right-wing things as well? I can't recall. Uh, I, I can't tell you exactly. Yeah, well, that guy, uh, Lawrence King, was very hooked up politically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's for sure. But yeah, yeah, so, a lot of so true, yeah, what you're seeing in True Detective is uh, is uh, real as well, right? I mean... Uh, yeah, I hunted down those detectives uh, down there in Louisiana, and I tried to get them to come... Oh, yeah. I tried to get them to come on the show. They wouldn't come on and talk about it. <laughs> I've, I've hunted down a lot of people. Uh, the guy who investigated... Um, uh, that uh, oh, I'll never remember the case. Now it was it was in uh, Stanford. Uh, I'll never I'll never remember. But, but that's in the Son of Sam book too. That uh, David Burke was admitted that the cult was involved in that. Oh, it's a girl's name, Arliss Perry. Arliss Perry. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I hunted down that detective too. He won't come on either. Um, but you know, interesting that her husband now he's a a, psych, a psychologist, a psychiatrist. And he treated the kids uh, who survived Waco. Huh. Yeah, he's involved in all, and he denies there's any kind of occult uh, involvement in his uh, wife's murder. Interesting. Interesting. Oh boy. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, man. Well, what else jumps out at you? What do you want to share with us? Anything? Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and and the the that thing with the the original one. Yeah. That's like full of stuff, right? What, what, That's what, curious what, because, uh, yeah, you've got, it, the, again, it's written by Roald Dahl, who was part of uh, Special Operations Executive, the high level British uh, black operations covert ops, PSYOPs. 
uh, you know, working with Ian Fleming and others, and then he decides he wants to write children's fiction, I guess, uh, you know, direct from, from one world to the other. And what you see there is a lot. I, I, I you know, I, I didn't think that there was, I would have thought that this would be as full of crazy stuff as it is, uh, because I, I hadn't seen this since I was in high school. Uh, I turned it on recently and I was just kind of like, Whoa, you know, I was blown away at, at, at uh, how traumatic it is. It, you know, he takes these kids into, into this, operation that he's got going and he kind of represents kind of uh, monopolistic capitalism and uh you know he has no qualms uh using them all in kind of an experimentation uh they're all commodities they're dispensable disposable um you know he has all this legality where he's you know they've all sort of signed their rights over to you know to to see his secrets or whatever and, you know, what's he doing? Well, he's genetically modifying the food. He's, like, throwing boots into vats, and he's saying that you're all going to eat <laughs> garbage, right? It's GMO stuff. Uh, and uh, I think the most uh, traumatic scene is at the beginning when they take the chocolate fairy ride, and he's he, it's kind of like an LSD trip, uh, and there's all this psychedelic stuff going on, and then in the background what you see is a bunch of images of death. So it's just really insane. <clears throat> and uh, I, I think it kind of represents on one level, like I said, it's a social political commentary on uh, uh, g global monopolistic capitalism kind of creating uh, class warfare and making people into commodities. And then I think on a deeper level, uh, Noel uh, Roald Dahl is telling you about Tavistock Institute. This is the kind of stuff that they would do. They're kind of the formative uh, precursor to MK Ultra program, which was ultimately a military operation trying to find a truth serum. And so there, it was, that's how you get this whole biochemical aspect to it. When the LSD and all that with Tim Leary, uh, this is, you know, Aldous Huxley's pr promoting all this. There's right out of the same uh, British establishment. And uh, yeah, that's what uh, I, I titled my talk on it. Uh, Charlie's uh, trauma factory, <laughs> Willy Wonka's trauma factory, right? Because that's what it's about. But I really think it's a commentary on, on the modern world as a whole. And uh, Roald Dahl's telling you exactly how the world works. It's not a kid's book. Yeah, right. You know, it's funny because you mentioned the, a lot of people talk about how, you know, everyone knows about LSD and it was, you know, CIA and, uh -huh. and um, Timothy Leary. But I just found out recently that the psilocybin mushrooms as well, uh, those come out of a lab. The ones here in the United States that grow freely and wild in the Northwest uh, come out from a lab. Those are from a laboratory sample. And uh, where they originate from in Europe, they're only found like under dead logs. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. here in the United States, they'll grow in wood chips. They, they grow everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, and it, they all showed up at, the, at a strange time too. So it, it's, a, uh, it's a plant as well as the LSD was a plant. Oh, yeah. And then that's covered in, uh John Marx's book, Search for the Manchurian Candidate, which I think is kind of a, a watered-down book. But I said there's a lot of good information in that book still. And he treats the whole history of psilocybin as well through Gordon Wasson, who was the J.P. Morgan executive who, with his wife, uh, traveled down, you know, south of the American border to try to find all these different hallucinogens. And, you know, he had the – he was promoted in Time magazine, his, his uh, LSD work. Uh, and so – but he, he didn't just uh, – you know, work with these ergots, he was also formative in psilocybin as well. So uh, there's a curious subcurrent with the whole techno rave culture and the rise of all that uh, out of, I guess, New Wave and Britpop, which, um, you know, McGowan argues was also kind of a CIA thing. And so, um, yeah, I've known some medium profile, not high profile, medium profile DJs, and they'll talk about this openly. They're like, oh, yeah, we you know we go to a big go to a big rave and uh, you know you certain people involved with certain uh, mobs uh, certain groups and they bring in the drugs to the raves under you know government approval so uh, yes so uh, there's a, a whole curious uh, intelligence and drug connection to the uh, techno rave electronica scene as well that's interesting because you know we were talking before about Heidi Fleiss mm -hmm. And uh, if you ever watched the movie by uh, Nick Broomfield, they talk about that guy Cookie. Mm -hmm. and, okay, yeah, he was uh, arrested later on for a, he was running a huge uh, uh, 
ecstasy ring, uh, importing ecstasy from Israel into the United States. Mm -hmm. And he was like one of the hugest traffickers of, of ecstasy in, in the country. Yep. Yeah. I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, the whole drug trade is a big aspect, a big piece of this, uh, you know, quote, New World Order puzzle. And I really, I, you know, Daniel Esselin has a, has a book on this, uh, Shadow Masters, and where he, he talks about how, you know, the, the drug trade is actually a big part of what keeps the American economy going. <laughs> Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a, lot I, people, I, a lot of people don't know that. Oh, yeah. I had Daniel on the show. I should have, we were talking about the Bilderbergs, but I should have him talk, come back about that. Uh, very interesting. Um, oh, what, uh, someone in the chat room was asking about uh, Shirley Temple. What do you know about that? Uh, good thought? question. Uh, I don't. I, I know about, um, oh, uh, uh, what's the uh, Wizard of Oz? What's her name? I'm gone. Oh, I'm, forget I'm, that one. Yeah, the... Yeah, that's probably one everybody. Judy knows. Garland, Judy Garland. Do you know about that? Yeah, that was that's Wizard of Oz. My God, yeah. Yeah, that's a total mind control movie. And then she's, yeah. you know, she's right there being, you know, the story is that she was dosed with painkillers, you know, all the time by the studio. She basically had to live at the studio. So uh, you know, there's a, this whole side of uh, it gets exaggerated in alternative conspiracy stuff. The idea of the handlers in Hollywood and all that it's somewhat exaggerated, but it's also very real. Uh, you know, you read about Marilyn Monroe, and she was kind of under house arrest and couldn't leave her house. Uh, she was under under handlers. So it's it, for I think a lot of the big level people, it's very real. Oh yeah. Uh, but uh, I think it's kind of exaggerated, uh, you know, on the internet. But uh, yeah, that's very real. I think the treatment centers uh, as kind of fronts is also very real. Oh yeah. Uh, all the all that kind of stuff is, is legit. Right, then you have I'm not sure, Temple. If anybody has any any insights on that, that would that would be news to me. Yeah, that would be something good to look into. But you know, uh, Judy Garland, Liza Minnelli. Mm -hmm. You know, she she married uh, a homosexual Satanist who was uh, best friends with Michael Jackson. Uh, who is this? Uh, Liza Minnelli. Right. Who who is it? Oh, uh, hey, if somebody in the chat room can look it up. Liza, who that guy Liza Minnelli married? That was um, he was a theater producer in New York City. Uh, uh, and um, what do you call it? Uh, and, yeah, and he was best friends with Michael Jackson too. Huh. Uh, I don't remember his name. And, and if you just look at this guy, there's no way these two ever had any kind of sex or anything. What their relationship was? <laughs> who knows? <laughs> now, what about? I don't, I don't know. I, I don't blame him. Maybe, maybe young Liza Minnelli. I don't know if I'd want to. Oh my God! Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> I always think of that character in Arrested Development where she's got vertigo and she's always falling down. You know, very weird too, because she was on The Apprentice too. She did a scene in The Celebrity Apprentice. You fired. You fired. <laughs> yeah, I wish. And Trump is blowing kisses at her while she's singing, and she sounded horrible. What do you think about the Trump campaign? It cracks me up when he's like, uh, "You know, we got a great campaign. It's great. You know, it's wonderful. We got a great, great people. It's going to be good. We're going to make America great again." <laughs> There's like no substance other than all these cut downs. It's like a cut down war. <laughs> it's really scary. Oh, but the guy is David Guest, who Liza Minnelli married. That's it. Yeah. 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 Every time I, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, they, too. Someone in the chat room was mentioning too. Remember how Michael Jackson's mother disappeared and then wound up down there at Canyon Ranch in Tucson? Yeah. Uh, doing all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 there's an interesting chapter uh, on uh, on uh, Jacko in. Uh, uh, I've, my friend uh, Jamie Hanshaw has a book, Hollywood Mind Control, and uh, she wrote a whole chapter on uh, Michael Jackson in that book, uh, which is which is really good. It's worth checking out. Oh, see if you can get get her to come on my show. Okay, sure. Okay. That that sounds good. Hollywood Mind Control. And speaking of Hollywood Mind Control, what do, what do you know about Britney Spears? Uh, I know a little bit more about her. So she, one of the most curious things about her is the time that she spent supposedly dating this military intelligence guy. Oh, and then he ended up dying uh, recently. Uh, in, they, I only think they dated a few years, but, but this, Sam, this was probably back in the two thousands at some point. But anyway, this guy ended up supposedly recently dying in uh, Afghanistan. Sam Lufty? Huh? Sam Lufty? Uh, uh, I could Google it. What? What? Is, I don't he was know. manager, and they were they were dating. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Sam Lufty. He's dead now. Because uh, he was he was handling um. Uh, Courtney Love, too. Britney Spears' ex-pilot uh, boyfriend, John Sundahl, has been killed. Different guy, okay. But uh, yeah, this is like some big uh, you know, big black ops guy. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. 
And then you had that case with those Olsen twins when uh, that guy died, Keith Ledger died. They sent they, they had Blackwater response team run over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, there's a lot of these too. The whole Star Whacker stuff. That's 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 all. There's there's some truth to that too. Oh, you think so? Yeah, yeah. A lot of those deaths are weird. And what do you make about the the theory that um, uh, some of them are not, fake? Some of them are fake, I think. By the way, a lot of crazy. Stuff. Oh, fake deaths that they're not really dead. Uh, not all of them. I'm saying I, I think some of them are simply because of the uh, monetary value that that you get from that propaganda. Right. And you know, you've again who who is uh well the cia has done this for a long time staging deaths uh there's movies about this too right uh there's body doubles this is a, a classic cia uh, thing as well um yeah i i don't know in what cases this happens i'm just saying that it's real and it does happen um it would probably be near impossible to prove any of this kind of stuff just because yeah, it, yeah how would you ever prove it and you know this cia has been doing this for decades so uh, but, I mean, you have guys who specialize in this. So um, I mean, there was actually a banker a couple of years ago who got caught staging his death. <laughs> and it was because he owed a bunch of money. So, I mean, if, if normal people uh, can pull this off or tr- almost pull it off, uh, you better bet the CIA does it. Yeah, that's true. There's no reason why they wouldn't have that ability, you know, and be set up for that. A, Just lot, in of, case. a lot of things are commodified, too, like uh, time on TV, right? Like uh, interview with Obama. Uh, yeah. uh, that's worth a certain amount of money. That's why Trump's always talking about. If I'm on this, if I'm on this debate, it's worth immediately four million dollars. Okay, <laughs> right. <clears throat> if I'm not here, you're losing four million. Four million. But uh, uh, it's the same way with a death, right? Uh, I'm not saying that I know for sure that I'm not saying Bowie didn't die. I'm just saying if you if you think about oh, oh he supposedly dies on his birthday, <laughs> uh, and now his album is like the number one album. I mean, there's a lot of oh, there's right. a lot of money in that. Yeah, David Bowie, yeah, that, that seems all too well planned out. Yeah, that's way too bizarre. I mean, I have no, there's no way to prove that. I have no way to prove that. I'm just saying it is bizarre, at least. Now, William Ramsey did a lot of work on the the occult uh, stuff in his, his last videos. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that, were, that was interesting, and uh, um, I did turn up some, some articles that discussed, uh, well, Bowie had these lyrics for a long time, you know, I'm... Closer to the golden dawn. You know, he's talking about the golden dawn and yeah. wearing Crowley's robes or whatever he says. Uh, so he definitely had an affinity for those things. And um, he, you know, a big part of, I should mention this too, a big part of uh, the occult and the esoteric uh, is stagecraft. And uh, you, you've, you've talked about Michael Aquino in, in, in uh, interviews that you've done before. Or guests have, and he has a whole book on this where he talks about the connection between black magic and stagecraft. So that's what I, what I'm saying is that that's another example of uh, Hollywood bridging this gap between reality and fiction and psyops and perception management. Which mm-hmm. it's overwhelming, you know. Mm-hmm. What do you? I asked you off the air, but uh, Sean Duff, uh, one of my producers, uh, wanted me to ask you about the Mandela effect. And what do you think about that? Well, I, I mean, named after the death of uh, Nelson Mandela, and if you read uh, Stephen Dorrell's book on MI6, uh, which is this big, fat, massive, excellent tome, uh, he talks about Nelson Mandela being a British uh, asset. So Nelson Mandela was actually working for MI6, and that would lead me to believe that whatever subterfuge I'm seeing with Nelson Mandela is at the behest of uh, British psyops experts. It's probably not real. And so if there's a supposed memory that people have of Nelson Mandela dying at some point and then he's still alive, uh, I would probably chalk it up to some sort of staged news event or British psyops before I would chalk it up to some uh, quantum entanglement. Well, yeah, yeah, I can't imagine that because I've always been uh, watching Mandela my whole life, you know, and I can't imagine that if he would have died, I wouldn't have known about it you know it was a big event i can't believe it happened twice you know and uh, I, i've read through some of those lists of things that are part of the mandela effect and, and some of them are just totally ridiculous they are ridiculous the only one that's weird is the berenstein bears uh, that one i i can't uh, there's probably some explanation for it i don't know i haven't spent a whole lot of time on it but uh, that one is a little weird that one is certainly is weird yeah because like i said to you before we we were really into that book when uh, i had a girlfriend she had two little kids and we read that book uh 
a million times. Yeah, I grew up with it. Yeah. Yeah, and I grew up with it too. It was one of my favorite books. Yeah. Now yeah. that I think about it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Listen, we're getting toward the end. We got like eleven minutes left. What have I not asked you about that, uh, that you think I should be? Oh uh, well, let's see here. I got you know hundreds of articles and reviews. Um, uh, let's see. How about? Did you ever watch the show The Prisoner? Uh, no, I'm familiar with it though. Yeah, but it's very, very odd. Yeah, go ahead. You should watch that. It's a very uh, philosophical presentation of British intelligence that actually mixes spycraft, science fiction, and the esoteric of all things. Uh, but if you haven't seen it, it probably wouldn't be, be worth talking about. But uh, you should check that out sometime. There's there's some really curious, deep stuff in there that uh, that I pull out. But um, you know, we talked about Hitchcock. We talked about uh, you know Bond and all all that kind of stuff. But uh, I, you know, I do a lot of analyses of kind of newer comic booky type movies because even though you might think that comic book movies are stupid uh, they actually have a lot of uh, a lot of this same type of stuff in it for example in this new avengers film uh, you had uh, a really the avengers film and the uh, 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 captain america winter soldier what you have there is the the presentation of uh, ai and mass surveillance uh, and not just ai and mass surveillance but actually the idea of predictive algorithms that would give you a kind of pre-crime all right, so you could figure out who, you know, Minority Report, Philip K. Dick style, who's uh, going to be the future threat. And, you know, this is kind of the kind of stuff that uh, the Pentagon, the military actually does do. They really do have AI programs that deal with what they call simulant world, uh, simula simulant world operations where they will war game uh, real time, real world scenarios uh, on a mass scale. And uh, there are white, white papers on this. This is not made up science fiction. It's, it's actually real, even though it was uh, in uh, Isaac Asimov books back in uh, you know 40s or 50s. Uh, Foundation series talks about the idea of predictive algorithms based on uh, mass tracking. Uh, and you see this come up in these uh, these new Marvel blockbuster Avenger films. Right, and this is what they're all about. Is uh, it's all about AI, transhumanism. So I, I deal with that a lot, too. Uh, I've got numerous <laughs> science fiction film analyses that talk about kind of the reality between or the bridge between, uh, uh, you know, reality and fiction, uh, particularly in the sci fi tech arena. So I, I write quite a bit about transhumanism. OK, let me think. Because while I got you here, there's so many, <laughs> so many different movies I could ask you about. Uh, Oh, oh, yeah. What about like a, this new movie, MK America? Yeah, I did an analysis of that. Uh, American Ultra, that one. Yeah, that one. Yeah, American Ultra. Yeah. yeah what I thought was curious about this was uh, it kind of makes it give it this cool, uh, you know? Oh, MK Ultra, that was cool. Uh, and it and it always plays up on this same old line of the idea that MK Ultra was all about uh, alternate personas, trigger words, and assassins. And that's right. not what it's about. Uh, I mean, that was an aspect of maybe one of the sub projects, maybe, which we don't actually know for sure if it was, um, but because half of the boxes were destroyed by uh, Richard Helms. But what, it, what, what it's really about is mass social engineering. That's what MKUltra is really about. And so the entirety of pop culture, I believe, is pretty much under the aegis of MKUltra. That's what it's really about. It's about the combination of bio uh, warfare. Uh, LSD, the drug culture, the drug subculture, counterculture, combined with the pop culture. Uh, and that's why you see some of the pop stars, you know, that's their whole message is all about this crap. And, uh, you know, I, I illustrate all this in my analysis of the film. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a mainstreaming of it, I guess you could say. And the idea is really about, uh, the film is really about the fact that the two teenagers that you're seeing, the Jesse Eisenberg and Kristen Stewart characters, are just representatives of uh, the millennial generation, uh, and they're pretty much complete <laughs> mind control, mind, completely completely under mind control. I mean, it didn't end the you know the, the apology that we got. Uh, you know, when Clinton apologized for MK Ultra, uh, those programs didn't end. Uh, MK Ultra was moved to Fort Detrick and changed to MK Search, and all of these programs continued on. 
it became directly under uh, the Department of Energy um, biowarfare type stuff. Uh, and you can trace all that in John Marx's book. Um, so, you know, that's what we're dealing with with this film is, is a comical fictional presentation of uh, something that's very real, but is not about, you know, trigger words and assassins. It's about uh, pop culture, social engineering. Have you looked into any kids' cartoons? Uh, I have. I'm, I'm familiar with a lot of uh, what's going on there, um, but I've not treated that extensively at my site. Um, but if you go back and watch G.I. Joe, that was, that was, that's one of the best. They were talking about uh, weather control, you know, like back in 1983 or 84 uh, in the G.I. Joe episodes. Um, so those are 100% packed with, uh, you know, everything that we've been discussing, as well as episodes on the occult. Uh, there's an, a... a Destro, uh, his family is a Scottish bloodline that worships uh, some sort of entity, and they practice human sacrifice. <laughs> uh, that's that's in GI Joe, believe it or not. No, I believe it. Yeah, it could, in the eighties, it was a hundred times worse. The kids' cartoons today uh, aren't they? They kind of they're not in your face as much as it used to be back in the eighties. Yeah, except for the a lot of the Disney and uh, uh, yeah. Cartoon Network stuff, but that's kind of geared towards an older audience. But but a lot of the Disney stuff is pretty overt. Um, and you know that's just I view Disney as kind of a an arm of the uh, Pentagon military industrial entertainment complex. You know they're they're all about this stuff. Look at the Siemens Corporation, their relationship to Disney. Uh, you know all the tech mind control stuff that they're involved in, and it you know becomes pretty obvious as why the Department of Defense was involved in installing uh, you know biometric scanning at Disney World and all this. Mm-hmm. It's it's one big uh, you know mind control experience really. Really yeah, Disney has one of the greatest uh, databases of face and name to email yep. that exists in the world because they have a thing in there you can go in and, and take a picture of yourself and then email it to yourself. <laughs> they got they're, your also face a, they're, they're also <laughs> a city state with uh, their own. Uh, oh, uh, forget own, that. I'm serious. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people I, don't believe that, they don't, it's, that it has its own kind of constitution. But, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, um, uh, you, you know, but yeah, there's a there's a a, a toy they sell because you know I watch Adult Swim sometimes. The next you know in the morning when the regular cartoons start, there's a toy they sell that's a little Mayan pyramid where they're shooting uh, flames at these little uh, lizard people coming running up the Mayan pyramid. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just it's mind blowing with what's going on. Yeah, yeah I mentioned uh, uh, Jamie Hatchell earlier. Uh, her book, she's got. Uh, she has two, three books now, and in the first, uh, first two books, she treats children's toys. Oh, really? And, and the actual, yeah, the, the actual strategy and programs behind not just the cartoons, but also the toys. And that's all very real, too. Okay, you got to get me both of those guests. Absolutely. All right, we're toward the end of the show. Jay Dyer, thank you so much. Uh, Jay'sAnalysis.com and the book Esoteric Hollywood. It's not available yet. When's it going to come out? Uh, it's uh, June of 2016, and, and if I could, I'd also like to add that what I offer in my subscription service isn't just uh, you know podcasts and talks. I also do a lot of philosophy lectures. Okay. So if you're interested in kind of getting a, a, a groundwork in uh, you know the history of Western philosophy, uh, you know I, I work from Plato and Aristotle and kind of the classics. Yeah, one of the one of the chatters was saying.